There's no shame in fear, my father told me. What matters is how we face it. Jon Snow, the bastard of Winterfell, the 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch since the age of 14, is without a doubt one of the most intriguing characters in Game of Thrones. Under the stigma of his illegitimacy, without any titles or privileges, he accomplishes to rise from nothing while remaining true to his moral values and just to those whose lives depend on him. Although there's no such a thing as the main hero in the Game of Thrones, it's in Jon that the multitudinous links of the storyline and even the very title of the story converge and are manifested. The fate of the Seven Kingdoms is inextricably intertwined with Jon Snow's fate, for he's the one who stands between them and the others while humans squabble in their petty wars. A bastard with the blood of the kings, the First Men and the Valyrians, who floats in the unknown of his own origins, the one who rises from nothing to unite the worlds which would never as much as imagine their unification, and the one in whose veins alone run both the ice and the fire. A great strategist and warrior most suitable to be a king, but who maintains his humbleness nonetheless, Jon Snow has experienced mocking, humiliation, death, loss and despair, but despite all, he's managed to keep a noble heart. Although decisive on the outside, Jon is a rather conflicted person who struggles to break free from the clutches of the shadow of his feelings of inferiority, accept his repressed desires and reconcile his ideals with reality. In this video, I'll attempt to elucidate Jon Snow's role in A Song of Ice and Fire, possible future, psychological profile, mythology and symbolism, and more. Get ready for a deep dive in. I specifically recommend you to watch the mythology section, as it gets quite insane. Background and the Mother Complex As we know, Jon Snow was raised as the bastard son of Eddard Stark, his second oldest son. Eddard refused to disclose to him or anyone any information about his mother and there was never any positive mother figure for him. Caitlin Stark was notorious for her unjustified hatred and enmity towards John. Despite that, John showed her kindness. When she blames herself for Bran's accident, he tries to console her only to meet with her insults and poisonous glance. She goes as far as calling him by his name for the first time, only to say that it should have been him who should have fallen from the tower. Despite everything, he's always wanted her to like him. He's always wanted a mother as his only normal. If there was anyone to blame for Edith's infidelity, however, it was obviously Edith himself, not John. In order to prevent resentment taking the place of love she feels towards Edith, Caitlin must find someone else to transfer it on to. And of course, who else to scapegoat than John, the fruit of Edith's betrayal? This pathological cognitive displacement is so bizarre and yet so common. Through this immoral hypocrisy, she never failed to remind John that he was just a bastard, someone who will never belong to the family and should be ostracized, contributing to the development of a rather dissonant mother complex in John. John remembers this bastard treatment on various occasions and its consequences are deeply ingrained in him. It shaped part of his personality along with his moral, sometimes blindly moral, attitude and his attitude towards women, which was strengthened by the oaths he'd taken. The strength of the bond he has with Arya is partially built on compensation for a mother figure. John unconsciously seeks a mother in every woman he meets. This is fueled by his unconscious feeling of guilt. As is often the case, the child blames itself for the parent's attitude and is related to the need for validation, which goes back to the childhood need of nourishment, security and support provided by the mother, which is something John never received. Behind this looms the only and pathological experience with a mother figure, Caitlin Stark, whose image is being imprinted onto women. They're something prohibited but also admired and desired. They're the ones in control and almost transcendental in nature, as it's difficult or impossible to approach them. They inspire awe and one is helpless before them, but yet is driven to help them. 
Whether we look at John's relationship with a great Val or Melisande, we find these patterns there. Neurosis, morality and inferiority complex. Ironically, although he was raised and is living under the belief that he's a bastard, the truth seems to be the very opposite. It's very likely that he's even already king in the north because of Rob's will. I'm also quite certain he's not Edit's bastard at all, but the resolution to his pathological view of himself wouldn't be found even if he found out that his parents are, most likely, Rhaegar and Lyanna. That is, unless they somehow got married. It wouldn't erase the fact that he rose from nothing in any case, and it would bolster his position as the decisive factor of the future events. Regardless of all this, John must learn to overcome this idea that he's someone who shouldn't exist, as that's the idea that hides behind the thought, I'm a bastard. No matter how significant his achievements are, he's always pursued by this idea and therefore engages in ideational self-mortification. John's neurotic symptoms can be traced to overcompensation for his feelings of inferiority. As a coping mechanism, he clings excessively to Edith's ideals, as he was the only person who acknowledged that he's his own blood, a Stark. The focal point of John's neurosis lies in his ostracization. His ideals, which is the inner manifestation of his father, the moral purity he wishes to preserve, represent an obstacle in his making of decisions. Being noble of heart is a requirement in a good ruler, see Danny, but it's not enough. That's why Maester Aemon gives him the advice to kill the boy. To an extent, this desire to preserve morality at all costs is selfish and foolish, and here is where we once again get back to John's self-mortification. He's trying to escape this image of being an unwanted creature that pursues him, and the only way to do so is to live up to the expectations of his father and uphold his moral values to prove that he's not just a bastard. At the same time, this is in conflict with the repressed grudge and anger towards his unjustified treatment and the desire to be recognised as a Stark, which he refuses to acknowledge as he believes it would be immoral and disloyal. The struggle between what he rightfully deserves because of his competence and achievements and how he can't have it because he's a bastard, which means he can never be a Stark despite wanting to be one, is the crux of the conflict. All this is perfectly summed up in one of John's thought processes. Bastard children were born from lust and lies, men said. Their nature was wanton and treacherous. Once John had meant to prove them wrong, to show his lord father that he could be as good and true a son as Rob. I made a botch of that. Rob had become a hero king. If John was remembered at all, he would be as a turncloak, an oathbreaker, and a murderer, who was glad that Lord Eddard was not alive to see his shame. And we see it in the scene when he's practicing swordplay with Iron Emmet, gets disconnected from reality, and remembers how Rob told him he could never be Lord of Winterfell, just like his mother had said. And he gets filled with anger and doesn't hear Iron Emmet yield. Or when Stannis offers him Winterfell, but despite his desire to accept, he lies to himself, saying that he never wanted this, as he believes that wanting it would mean that he wanted his siblings' deaths, thus once again engaging in self-mortification to keep the desires at bay. Sacrifice of preservation of one's moral purity for a higher purpose is where the greatness of Jaime Lannister shall be taken note of. Jaime sacrificed his oaths, his honour, his name, morality itself, and even the way he will be remembered, only to do what was actually right when he decided to slay the Mad King. And he didn't even tell the true story to clean his name. This is what it means to kill the boy, and what both John and Danny will inevitably have to undergo if they ever want to assume the position of a successful ruler. That is, to remain sane and righteous while having to make tough decisions is the main challenge they face. Both have already learned a great deal about it in the last book, however. John isn't a character of stagnation as, for example, Stannis. He grows and learns from his mistakes, and that's what makes him fit to lead in the command. 
I know that I know nothing, Socrates once said. And just like him, John acknowledges this, and that's what marks the beginning of the path towards great wisdom. Dream Analysis John's dreams demonstrate extremely well the nature of his fears, desires and inner battles, and of course foreshadow the story and even hint at his true parentage. I'll focus on one dream in particular, which also offers us insight into John's psyche, not only into the story. His descendants into the crypt of Winterfell dream is especially significant. It starts with John opening doors in the hall as he's looking for someone, but he doesn't even know whom he's looking for. Already from this alone we know that he wants to know who his mother is. Hall here is a feminine symbol, the connecting link with aspects of one's personality. He says that most nights it's his father he's looking for, that is, his true parentage. The castle is always empty and there's no one to respond. That seems to suggest that both his parents are dead. And this dream was described in the first book when Eddard was still alive, mind you. As appearance of one's home in dreams represents basic needs, such as shelter and nourishment, we can clearly see that this is what John seeks but can't find, as he doesn't belong because of his bastardy, and is related to his mother complex also. He sees tables full of bones, which frightens him, and he runs up the stairs. This symbolism is a textbook example of escaping from one's urges. The tables and the bones represent natural urges one has. John is frightened of them, so he climbs up the stairs, which clearly means escaping from one's urges here. As we later see, this is exactly what John does and from which stems his neurosis. He represses his wishes to keep his morality intact. He then finds himself facing a door to the crypt beneath Winterfell, which represents the entrance into the unconscious. He descends into the womb, into the unconscious content. He seeks the answer to the question of his origins, but is confounded, for he desires to know, but there's just darkness, for he can't know, while at the same time, the closer he gets, the more terrifying it becomes. Not only does this dream tell us right away that John isn't a Stark, it also portrays the conflict this fact produces in John, his desire to know who he is, and at the same time his fear of knowing. John and Ghost Direwolves are very much like spirit animals of the Stark children, something like the demons from his Dark Materials book series, that is, physical manifestations of a human soul that's unique to every individual. They seem to reflect the most intimately guarded trait of the owner. Just the very appearance of John's direwolf ghost might serve us as a hint. His white eyes on the outside, but his eyes, which are the window to the soul, are red. Fire. This could be saying that although Jon Snow looks like a Stark, his blood is in reality that of a dragon, a Targaryen. The parallels between Jon and Ghost are very important for the story, as what Ghost is tells us what Jon embodies. When the Stark children find five direwolves in the beginning of the book series, John is the only one who hears the sixth one, an albino that either crawled or was driven away. Just like John, despite being one of them, he's not really one of them. This segregation is brought up on various occasions. And it's never been accidental. It's clear that John, despite being a Stark, isn't just a Stark like the legitimately born Starks. John is segregated from the Starks as a bastard. But why would we this explored further if there wasn't more to the story? After all, it wouldn't matter in terms other than the norms of the society who the mother is. They're all Starks. What this points at is that in John's case, it's his father who set him apart. It's the fathers who determine the line the person belongs to, after all. It sets him apart, but he still is a brother. Therefore, it must be clear that it's the father that's not a Stark, not the mother. And with all the other indications, I don't think there's any doubt that the R plus L equals J theory isn't a theory, but a fact. John's fear to acknowledge that he's in reality a walk stems from his denial of the repressed animalistic urges within. In his pursuit of moral purity, that which goes as much as slightly against it has to be pushed away. 
John is human and he wants to avenge and be avenged. What matters is that he never gives in to these desires. The problem arises, however, when he refuses to even acknowledge their existence. Ghost represents John's shadow, his animalistic side. He fears that once he gives in, he'll be overpowered by his darker side and become a monster. What he must do is to incorporate his shadow into his consciousness and acknowledge openly that he has the right, rightfully gained, to be a lord and a ruler, that it's not his fault when others die or he can't save everyone and reconcile that to hold grudges doesn't mean one will act upon them. All this is the fantasy of the naive boy he must kill to let the man be born. There are indications that John walked into a ghost after he was stabbed, and I do think it is the case and will play a role in John's return to his body. From my point of view, it also represents a literal act of killing the boy. John dies and will be reborn as a more mature and resolute version of himself. The importance of this act is also symbolical, as the merging of the two might foreshadow his reconciliation with both parts of his heritage, both the ice and the fire. The question of John's second sidekick, Mormon's Raven. Mormon's Raven is a very interesting creature that I think is actually Brynden Rivers, the Blood Raven, the three-eyed crow, the green sea of Bran encounters living with the children of the forest in a cave beyond the wall. There are many parallels between Brynden and John. Just like Ghost, Brynden is an albino, white hair, red eyes, and Brynden's personal arms were a white dragon with red eyes. He was one of Aegon IV Targaryen's bastards and was later legitimized, which could all be hints at Jon's origins and a bit of foreshadowing. He's now perhaps the only one to possess the knowledge that Jon is a Targaryen, but seems to be waiting for the right moment to reveal it to him. As Jon grows in wisdom as a leader, we see how progressively the hints given from the Raven are becoming more and more obvious. In the first book, Jon also points out that the Raven likes fruit and corn, and Maester Raymon replies that it's a rare bird, as most ravens will eat grain but prefer flesh. Later, the raven helps John get elected when it flies out of the cage and lands on his shoulder. It cries, burn, burn, when John is fighting the white in the first book, thus telling him how to defeat it. It's also present during important discussions about the problems the Night's Watch has to deal with, for which Brynden is also keeping an eye on it as well. Will love be John's great glory and great tragedy? In the first book, when Maester Raymond reveals to John that he's a Targaryen, it's exactly then when he tells John about the pain of choosing, the battle between honour and duty and love and desire. The discrepancy between love being what makes us noble but also what leads us to tragedy seems not to resonate with John at the time, or rather in his own words, it doesn't sound right to him. And I'd say that, without a doubt, this scene is quite strong foreshadowing of the main battle that rages within John. It's the battle between his honour, the values passed down onto him by his father, and the vows of the Watch, and between that what is the right thing to do, the love he bears for his family, for his brothers, for the lives of other human beings, which is in direct conflict with his duty. In the end, however, I think that John is the one who will transcend the nonsensicality of the Watcher's vows. He kind of did already, but is conflicted about it. And just like what he said about his father, he will do what is right. Mythology Jon Snow, the Son of Fire There's genuinely so much to talk about in terms of mythology when it comes to Jon Snow and his possibly being Azor Ahai that it was really hard to make it succinct. Nevertheless, brace yourselves for what's to come because the parallels I'll show you aren't easy to dismiss at all. For starters, we will look once again at the moment Jon is called Corn King by Mormon's Raven. It definitely doesn't seem to be accidental. The myth of the Corn King is the myth of the sacrificial king, a deity, who descends to the earth to die only to be resurrected amongst the gods. It's very ancient and actually central to almost all of the world's mythologies. This myth originally arose from the cycle of planting and harvesting, which is the passage from winter to spring. 
The Corn King sacrifices himself for the earth, for the land, for the good harvest to come next year, or in other words, for spring to come again. He dies in winter in order to be reborn in spring, wiser. He has many different names across different cultures. Adonis in Greece, Tammuz in Babylon or Sumer, Osiris in Egypt, Mithras in Persia, Baldur in Scandinavia. In Britain, the Corn King has the name of John Barleycorn. In ancient days, corn was literally the king as it could feed many people. He's the Irish sun god Lu and the Brythonic sun god Lu, whose totem is the eagle, sunbird, who wields a fiery spear, lightbringer. Remember that John even has a dream where his blade burns red in his fist, and whose name refers to light. Its modern forms are Luke, Luke and Lucifer, the Lightbringer. Lu is killed and reborn wiser, the legend says. He's portrayed as a warrior, a master craftsman, a king and a savior. He's associated with oaths, truth and the law, or in other words, with rightful kingship. Some of his epithets include of long hand, a parallel to John's sword, long claw, Equally skilled in all the arts, youthful warrior or hero, fierce striker and wolf son. Interestingly, when Lou is killed just like John, he stabbed and transforms, walks into an eagle. It's a song that transforms him back into his human form. After that, he casts down the usurper of the throne and ascends it himself. The name John is theophoric, which means that it carries the name of and is under the protection of a god. It means God is gracious, or gift of Jehovah. In the Aztec mythology, Quetzalcoatl, whose name means the feathered serpent, a camouflage dragon, perhaps, who gave the people corn, which was essential to Aztec life, is also associated with death and resurrection. All this gives John's death a meaning on quite a different level. In the times of winter, the Corn King dies so that spring may return. He sacrificed to feed the people. John took a dagger in his heart for his people. He risked his life for his people. He took a knife in the heart for his people. John's death and resurrection therefore appear to be of great significance. If he'll be reborn amid smoke and salt, we'll know exactly why. There are also many indications that Jon Snow is the prince that was promised, or as a Rahai. The burning sword dream, Melisander asking the fires to show her as a Rahai and all they show is Jon Snow, all the mythological parallels, ice and fire in his blood and so on. As a Rahai may not be who or what we think it might be, as prophecies are fickle and easily misinterpreted, but Jon's importance for the future main event of the world of Game of Thrones is undeniable. White Wolf in Japanese mythology, White Wolf has a very important position. There's a White Wolf god who mated with a goddess, and the offspring of this union became the ancestors of the Ainu people who live on the island of Hokkaido. What can be found in Dacian mythology is even more interesting. Dacian warriors had dragon wolf banners, and they believed it was a manifestation of their supreme god, Zalmoxis, whose name is thought to mean the god of god, Wolf, Brilliant, or Sun, and he was also known as the Sky Dragon. His favourite animal was White Wolf. There's a legend called the Legend of the Great White Wolf, in which Zalmoxis transforms one of his servants into a White Wolf, who's seen as the most feared and respected creature from all of Dacia. His purpose was to protect the Dacian people and gather all the wolves from the forest. Whenever the people were in trouble, the howl of this wolf would summon wolves to protect them. In Slavic mythology, the god Dashbok, whose name means the giving god, is not only a solar god, but also a god of fire and rain. His father was Svarok, the god of fire. Dashbok had an affinity for wolves, like many Slavic gods, but his ran deeper. Though he was connected to the sun, the white wolf was thought to be his holy symbol. He was a shapeshifter who could also appear as a white wolf himself or as an old man dressed in wolf or bear furs. White wolf in mythology is usually a divine messenger that appears in times of need, represents the role of a helper, guide and protector. 
What's even more interesting is that, just like the corn god, White Wolf is often associated with the sun, the symbol of life and resurrection. Thank <laughs> you.